The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Well, Paul, we're recording, and you know, I don't know how to start the show, so I will I will just say <laughs> this is the Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto. This is our recap extravaganza, mm-hmm. and uh, if you're watching the video, you can see us. If you're listening to the audio, we have a guest host with us, but first, Paul, it's been quite a year. Will you remind the audience, what have we been doing on this show, or what, what do we do on this show? In general, thanks for asking, Matt. Great to see you. Um, in general, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, but not tonight. Tonight is a special night. Um, and I will not steal our, our co-host thunder and I'll let him explain what's going on, but I should at least introduce him. So we are joined by the, the popular and beloved Chris, the Chu man, Chu, oh, Dr. Um, Chu, how are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. This is, <laughs> yeah, he nodded for those of you listening at home. <laughs> Apparently this is. Apparently this is the fifth year. This is the fifth year that I've done a recap episode with you guys for the whole year. So it's been quite a journey and um, I'm, I'm happy to be invited back. Yeah. So let's, let's go through some stats, Chris. Um, yeah. So we produced over 62 episodes this year, which adds to our library of over 300 shows. I think today uh, uh, on the day of a recording, we, we produced our 311th episode and that doesn't even include some of the ones that we just decided not to number so it's been pretty impressive if you look at our social yeah, media i don't know we why have, we did that that was kind of confusing yeah some of our uh, i think some of the hotcakes back back in the day we did decide not to n- number them but um we have more than forty thousand followers on twitter sixteen thousand on instagram and 15 on facebook and now we're on tiktok um <laughs> <laughs> so you know we're even you know I think one of the amazing things was on iTunes, of course, remember to please rate and comment. Uh, we received the highest praise of all time when we got the comment of, we we're called the Ted Lasso of medical podcasts, much to the delight of Dr. Paul Williams. <laughs> it's it's fine to like a thing. I just thought that his deal was he's a bumbling idiot. So like I, I'm concerned about the comparison, but I also don't I watch should, the show. I should also mention that just as of this week, you can you can rank shows or you can uh, give a star rating to shows on Spotify. So please uh, uh, give us some stars on Spotify. Five stars. We will accept five stars. Uh, not nothing less. Thank you. <laughs> so Chris, uh, what were you were going to mention? Some of our top downloads, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of our top downloads of the year include number one is the antibiotic primer, which is number 284, followed closely by the hypertension updates, number 254. And to round out the top 10, we have the common skin complaints, which is one of our Durham Cider episodes, dominate stable an- angina, the hypercalcemia episode, diabetes FAQ, COVID-19 vaccines, high in de- iron deficiency, sarcoidosis, and peripheral artery re- disease. You know, some of these we're going to talk about today, but I really highly encourage people to check these episodes that they haven't already. And, you know, if you can't remember all the ones I just listed, check our show notes. You'll be able to find it pretty quickly. Oh, Paul, uh, I think I heard a cat. So I heard probably a cat. Ollie is recording with us as usual. <laughs> Ollie is present. Yes. <laughs> with that, I am excited to hear more from the rest of our team. I will remind the audience that while many of our episodes are available for free CME credit, This episode, because it's the end of the year, we need a little bit of a break. There will not be CME for this one, but a lot of the episodes we're talking about are available for free CME through VCU Health, our great friends at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And you can go on there, create an account, and you can claim that for free. So let's start talking about some medicine. And Chris, I believe you were going to start us off with another message from a great Curbsiders team member. That's right. And just to uh, remind people, you know, throughout the year, we developed a whole bunch of new series, including the Tales from the Curbside, which uh, you and Paul have sort of developed, bring, you know, pearls, serve in a a repetitious format for us to listen to in the high yield format, as well as we continue the uh, the hot cakes episodes. You know, we've went to multiple conferences like SGM, ACP, you know, still doing live shows. I mean, you're 
your 300, uh, number 301, the top pearls from 2021 from Tri Tri Service ACP, sort of like a sister episode to this one today. Um, so we had lots of pearls that came throughout the entire year. And even new ones will be coming with us with, you know, spinoffs like Curbsiders Teach, you know, what we're doing over on the Curbsiders. And we have this brand new newsletter of the Digest, which we may talk a little bit about. But Garbs Garbatelli, she decided that she had a couple of pearls she wanted us to listen to. So I'm going to play those right now. Hey, Beth Garbs Garbatelli here. A few of my favorite episodes from the past year included our episode on pelvic pain. I really appreciated Dr. Lambu's step-by-step walkthrough of a trauma-informed pelvic exam. I also really liked our episode on smoking cessation. Don't have a specific pearl from there, but I thought that uh, he gave a helpful framework for thinking about smoking cessation and tobacco use disorder and ways to approach medication management for those patients. I also liked our series on diarrhea a topic that I would not have expected to enjoy listening to people talk about. I think it was a really fun uh, set of episodes, and I thought some of the tips about thinking through chronic diarrhea re were really helpful, and I liked the pearl that uh, osmotic diarrhea will resolve with fasting. I think we have some also really fantastic episodes coming down the pike in the next couple of months, so stay tuned and get excited, and thank you so much for listening. Beth always has just the best pearls, and I, I love the way she sort of brings some of the most um, interesting pearls that I, I really enjoyed throughout the year. And the fact that number 311 just came out this morning, so you know I, I really enjoyed hearing about um, the pelvic exam and pelvic pain. And, I, and the way she talked about uh, trauma-informed pelvic exam I thought was really interesting because one of the things that, was, that came up in the episode that came out today was talking about uh, talking to the patient that they may not even need, well, they may not uh, submit to a pelvic exam right now. And I thought that was sort of an interesting thing to, that I didn't really think about. It's like someone shows up with pelvic pain, you would expect to have to do your exam right now, but um, maybe that's not something they want. So I thought that was a really great pearl from today's episode. I, I'm in the process of re-listening to that episode. To, the, the big thing she said about the trauma-informed exam are, it, the patient needs control and they need trust. So you need to provide them with both of those things and definitely listen to that because she really talks through a great framework for the approach to chronic pelvic pain. Paul, you're you're our smoking cessation uh, guru on the show, our, our budding addiction medicine guru. Uh, I guess Carolyn is is a certified uh, addiction medicine. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, out of yeah. the three of us here, I believe you'd be the person so what is uh what did you think about the smoking cessation episode? What were what were your favorite pearls? Yeah, no, it's I, I I'm glad that Garbs brought that one up. I think as we transition to our, our the addiction medicine topics, we like that I thought that was a great episode. And the pearl I that stuck with me the most, though I think they were all gold, is actually using the time to the first cigarette as sort of a, a measure, a proxy for how dependent on nicotine someone is. So if someone wakes up First thing they do is reach for a cigarette. So within 30 minutes, that that portends probably a higher degree of dependency than someone who can get up, brush their teeth, read the newspaper, drink their cup of coffee, walk the dog, and then smoke a cigarette. Um, unless they're doing those things very quickly. So like I, I think using that as a way to sort of dose nicotine replacement therapy. So for instance, if someone takes less than a half hour to smoke a cigarette, then maybe doing the higher dose scum, um, I thought was a really practical and useful tip. And then also all the stuff about the dosing, about how we're probably underdosing nicotine replacement in general. Yeah. Um, and if someone is smoking while on the patch or smoking while using other modalities, it probably just means they're not getting enough nicotine and you, you should not give up. You should actually up the dose of the replacement you're doing. I, I found that entire discussion hugely helpful. Uh, I was always taught like they, you have to take the patch off if you're going to smoke. And the, our guest is like, no, that's not true. They, they they might just feel like jittery or they might feel like it was, you know, if they were nicotine naive or if you have too much coffee and you ever feel like slightly nauseous or a little jittery. So their heart's not going to explode. Their blood pressure is not going to go up to like, you know, emergent hypertensive emergency levels and they're going to stroke out. They, there's just, they might just get a little bit too much nicotine. So uh, definitely be liberal with the nicotine replacement. And uh, if you can get the medication, it's, it's nice right now, there's been a varenicline recall and uh, Chris can you tell us, I think you were looking something up about this, that there was, that there's a way to go around this? Yeah. So um, I thought what was really frustrating was the smoking cessation episode for you guys came out. And then we actually had a smoking cessation episode over on the Cribsiders come out recently too. And in the midst of all this, the Verena Clean recall happened and we're like, ah, but I, a cool thing that one of my pharmacists over here at uh, the Cash Lake State University, um, they, they, came, they, they brought us um, the fact that 
this uh, varenicline tartrate, now also known as apovarenicline, was actually FDA approved to allow temporary importation from Canada. And so, um, in fact, depending on, I think many states, um, a lot of pharmacies are doing automatic conversions for varenicline to be right the script to apovarenicline. So it's sort of a cool thing. And, but if you want to know how to prescribe it uh, directly, we can, we can give you um, some of the pamphlets, uh, reading material that they have that they produced after the FDA approved for use. All right. Let's move on with addiction medicine. So that was number 252, smoking cessation. Paul, I wanted to talk about some of this acute pain management in the hospital because I find that patients with opioid use disorder, when they get hospitalized, the old thinking was, let's these patients can't have opioids, we're going to make their disease worse. And that is actually not the way to keep them in the hospital, to have them engaged in their care. You, you have to satisfy their opioid cravings. And one of the key insights is you have to provide, probably if, if they're already on an opioid at baseline, you're going to have to give them extra opioids on top of that for the acute pain that they're having. So that was one of the big take-homes for me. So Paul, what do you recommend people do with buprenorphine um, when, they're, when they have an acute painful condition? I know you mostly practice outpatient now, but what do you recommend? Yeah, and I, I think that the larger point of that episode was you, you just have to work with your patient and the surgeon in advance and actually be proactive about things because different patients will have different goals for themselves. So I, I think my, my personal preference, which matters almost <laughs> not at all, is that the patient should be should continue the buprenorphine and you just add on full agonist therapy on top of that. And that way you're not doing the rubbing your head, um, patting your belly, tap dancing <laughs> of trying to sort of then stop the full agonist and wait till they're a little bit withdrawing and then restart the buprenorphine. Like it just gets a little bit messy that way. So I just rather let the buprenorphine ride the entire time. But I think you have to engage the patients and find out what they're comfortable with and then also talk to the surgeons. And then I think that's probably the most important part is to have a pain plan yeah. before the patient goes to surgery rather than trying to deal with it. Yeah. Um, in the heat of things. So I think once I find out one of my patients is going to be going for surgery, I immediately say like, we, we have to talk to your surgeon. We have to figure out what our plan is and actually outline that in advance because otherwise you might get yourself in trouble. I, I like the split dosing of buprenorphine, either four milligrams, four times a day or eight milligrams, three times a day, depending on what their baseline dose is. And then when you say full agonist, we're talking hydromorphone, fentanyl, something like that, give an IV or PO on top of it to provide that extra pain relief. And you might have to use bigger doses because buprenorphine has a very high affinity um, for the, for the mu opioid receptor. So um, just wanted to make sure people know that don't, you know, don't force the patient to go through a withdrawal period, um, you know, so they can get back yeah. on their buprenorphine after the, after their hospital stay. Uh, I, I just, that, that's just hard on the patient and it, and you could still give them adequate pain control, even if you continue it. Um, Paul, and then where are we at with the X waivers nowadays? Do people still need to do this like long training and pay a lot of money to get it? No, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's wildly accessible though. I think, um, some of the requirements may vary from state to state, but it's, 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 it's so there's such a low barrier to access the X waiver. Yeah. Now I would just encourage everyone to apply. I think there, there are some trainings that are easily accessible that, and you can do, you can do the full Monty if you really want to, you just don't yeah. have to. So depending the on the now. state, I mean, they tried to remove this requirement to do a, a, this like four or eight hour, it was an eight hour training when I did it. So they tried to remove that requirement. Yeah. Now you can just apply, you just apply for the X waiver and at least in my state, Pennsylvania, you can get uh, you can get the X waiver designation on top of your DEA license without having to set, give proof of the training. So, uh, and Chris, what did you want to say to modify that? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, just to clarify for most people, you still need to have an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. That hasn't been removed because of the way legislation has because of the Data 2000 Act. Um, but what they were able to do is remove the requirements to get the X waiver, it's just for clarification. But every state may have some mild changes, like here in Ohio, where I live, even though you can get your X waiver without with just um, giving your notice of intent, you, to continue to have your X waiver, you still have to do eight hours of category one CME every two years. So, you know, every state may, may be different. So make sure you talk to someone who's knowledgeable in your state about using X waivers. But I think they were able to really decrease that ability for us to get that X waiver. I think it's been a great thing. Let's move on. Actually, before we move on, Paul, did you have any other addiction medicine pearls that you wanted to talk about before we, before we move on? 
No, I don't think we covered it this year. My my brief plug that the medications for alcohol use disorder are easy to prescribe and effective. So yeah. please think of those. But I, I don't think that's necessarily a pick from our show, but just a, a pick for life and, yeah. and medical and practice. And maybe an even bigger teaser that we're, uh, you know, maybe we'll be doing a lot more on addiction medicine in 2022, but uh, stay tuned. We're we're not ready to announce that yet. So let's let's talk some nephrology, Paul. Uh, I don't have the fancy transitions uh, that... <laughs> that uh, maybe, you know, the great Stuart Brigham, who we heard from earlier, would. But, Paul, tell me, uh, if I want to pass a kidney stone, I'm going to do my favorite device. I'm going to do this is my way of transitioning, Paul, <laughs> when I say something ridiculous and then you great. correct me. So if if Perfect. I am want to pass a kidney stone, I should be as tense as possible, load up on the uppers, lots of caffeine, nicotine patches, uh, all those things, and that'll help me, Correct. Yeah, no, it's funny you mentioned that, Matt, because that, that is, of course, all, all incorrect. Um, and I, I'm surprised you didn't say also um, just aggressive <laughs> hydration, yes, like gallons of water. Right. Um, so it, a, a couple of points that were made in terms of actual management of kidney stone. And, there's, and that's a great episode. So we're talking about episode 298, um, the management of urinary stone disease. But but basically, so let's say we've already made the diagnosis, which we talked about in depth, and we're trying to actually manage the patient who's, who's currently experiencing a urinary stone disease. Uh, you... The important thing that you're alluding to is the patient probably more than anything else should be relaxed, which is easier said than done, probably if you're having um, colically agonal pain. Um, the other thing is that NSAIDs are effective analgesia for these patients if, if they can tolerate it and they have the right um, medical profile to be able to do so. And then the other thing that I, I alluded to is the hydration point. I think I, I've certainly been guilty of this, telling patients, oh, you yeah. drink lots of water until you pass the stone, but that doesn't do anything at all except preferentially... Um, Pour, pour your circulation into the functioning kidney or the kidney that does not decide that does not actually have the stone. So you're not really making any kind of difference at all, except maybe you're making, making the their good kidney work because harder. they have to yeah. urinate more frequently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And making them pee more, which of course is a, a joy. Um, so all the point being, get the patients to relax, choose NSAIDs preferentially, and then don't have them drinking gallons of water. Um, just, just not becoming dehydrated. Then we had a lot of discussion in terms of prevention, which I know there's a lot of points, Matt, that, that you like specifically in terms of preventing subsequent stones. Yeah. Cause this is, this was what I was most like, it was always so confusing to me. Like, what do I tell these patients? And he gave us a lot of just general advice for like pretty much any patients with stones. You don't have to know the type, tell them like after they've got through their acute stone, you got to tell them you have to consistently drink water. He used to write a paper script for 96 ounces of water and you have to be uh, empathetic when you're doing this because some of these are middle-aged men with BPH or some of these are people that can't leave their desk and you're asking someone that it's not logistically easy for them to use the bathroom multiple times a day, but they have to hydrate to the best of their ability. And uh, so that's the key. Low sodium is good. Low animal protein is good. You don't want to be making like extra uric acid. And pairing, if you are going to eat oxalate-rich foods, which are very good tasting foods, Paul, and healthy foods, we don't want people to stop those totally. So uh, they should pair those with dietary sources of calcium. It doesn't necessarily have to be dairy, but that can help bind up the oxalate in the gut so it's removed in the gut and not in the urine. And then uh, right. if the person wants to take supplements, you know, they can. You could just tell them, hey, citrus fruits are good. That has extra, you know extra citrate. And then they could take potassium citrate supplements. And if they have high blood pressure, hydrochlorothiazide can reduce urinary calcium. So that's a good choice. And if they have osteopenia or osteoporosis, uh, low bone density, then uh, bisphosphonates also can help uh, lower uh, stones and urinary calcium. So that's also uh, all that favors prevention. And that's all like general advice that as internists, I think we're more than capable of giving. And you don't have to mess around with these fancy stone panels to tell them like, here's your personalized plan. You you could just be more general than that. Yep. Yep. And I just to, to emphasize the hydration is great for prevention. The hydration yeah. is not great for management. And I, I think that's a key point. Chris, you wanted to mention Tamsulosin? Oh, not, not, we don't have to talk about that much. You know, I think one of the things that came up in the episode uh, that you guys talked about was like how useful Tamsulosin is. I think there was a lot of discussion, like, you know, definitely Tamsulosin is not super useful for those like really, really small stones, less than four or five millimeters. And then it's sort of, as you get up to between the five and 10 and greater, obviously, you know, are, how often are they going to expel the stones? I think the, the, the takeaway you guys had from the episode was talking about, well, a lot of urologists will do it because overall, like the risk is still fairly low in using tamsulosin, even though there are some side effects. But 
Um, I, I think there are some randomized control trials versus some meta analyses that show that may be more useful or less useful. But and that, that was sort of the only thing that I think that I came up with as I was thinking about the episode. That's, and that was for the person with the acute uh, acute stone. In right. addition to their relaxation and their NSAIDs, you know, t- think about tamsulosin. Okay. Well, Paul, next I wanted to talk a little bit about nephrotic syndrome versus GN. And I'm going to, I'm going to speed through this a little bit. We can, we, we went really over the illness scripts there a lot, which I thought was really helpful. And Elena made a great infographic that I can include in these show notes. But what I thought was really cool was this anti PLA 2R antibody titer. That was one that I just wasn't familiar with. And the, these antibodies, you can use them because they're, they're commonly found in patients with idiopathic or primary membranous, uh, nephropathy. And uh, potentially, uh, I'm not sure Dr. Toff was honest that, you know, maybe maybe the person's still going to get biopsied, but it can be useful and you don't have to go, you know, if it's positive, you don't have to like do as exhaustive as, of a search for everything. So that's something that people maybe hadn't heard of before if they're like me, anti-PLA-2R antibody titers, you can, you can check those and then you can monitor them. They, they, he even mentioned for, for prognosis and for their response to treatment, the antibody titers, it's one of those things you can track over time as well. Right. Yeah. That was the part I, I thought was yeah probably most fascinating out of and all then, that. Paul, yeah. now this, and we are going to, I'm going to tease something else. We're going to talk about this, uh, this medicine again on another future episode, but amylaride. He mentioned that there's this, everyone thinks people get edema because of low albumin with nephrotic syndrome, but- in membranous nephropathy, they get better before the albumin gets better. So it's got to be something else. And it seems like there's like plasminogen gets activated and then plasmin activates ENAC channels or something like that. But the bottom line is, Paul, amylaride blocks ENAC uh-huh. channels. And maybe that's a great drug for these patients with like refractory edema or refractory high blood pressure when you're treating them for nephrotic syndrome. So keep that in your back pocket audience. And maybe you can just like slam dunk and break the backboard next time. Uh, people are like, I don't know what to do. I got this patient, nephrotic syndrome, edema, hypertension, throw on some amylaride and uh, maybe you'll get lucky. So we will, there is a citation. I'm not making this up. So we will uh, put this in the show notes, <laughs> but <laughs> It'd be amazing if you were, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just, uh, Spinning, spinning a web here, Paul. Um, Just in the yeah. pocket of Big Amilleride. <laughs> now, now, Paul, I wanted to ask you, the episode uh, number 308, also with the great Dr. Toff on metabolic alkalosis, uh, we, talked about, um, we talked about a lot of really cool stuff. My favorite stuff was talking about um, acetazolamide and some of the other things we can do for patients when we're giving them like aggressive diuresis. Do you remember what he said about why acetazolamide sucks for long-term use or why it's intolerable for patients? No, you should know better than to set me up with questions <laughs> well, no, like I'm that. Gonna tell you, I, that I haven't I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. It's, it's because no, it's me. because uh, carbonated beverages taste terrible if you're take if you're taking acetazolamide. Oh, I, I thought I thought I you might remember, you know, so like your patient wants a beer, it's going to taste terrible. Your patient wants a soda, it's going to taste terrible. So I I had never known that before. No, that's great. I, yeah, I'd forgotten about that yeah. particular pearl. So the, the, the big pearls from that episode uh, for me were about the, uh, specifically about these patients. If you're a hospitalist and you're treating someone with acute heart failure and you start to see that bicarb climb up, really what you want to do is replace their chloride. That's, that's mainly the reason they're having the metabolic alkalosis more so than volume depletion, which is, was kind of the classic teaching, which was wrong. So he talked about being really aggressive with potassium chloride, slowly increasing the dose, trying to get the potassium maybe even up to as high as like five. And you can actually monitor their urinary pH, Paul, because when their urinary pH becomes, uh, when they get bicarbonate urea, you know, the pH goes up like close towards eight then uh, then you know that your treatment's working. You know that you kind of repleted their chloride and now they're starting to pee out bicarb. They're, they've stopped retaining it. So um, I thought that was super cool. You can use this. This is the year of the urinary pH, by the, the way. Like I don't think I'd ever looked at no. it. Um, and now this year has come up time and time again. And the urinalysis is something, an actual important measure for yeah. a lot of stuff. So it's, I, yeah. if, if I learned nothing else from 2021, other than to wash your hands off and it is, <laughs> look at the urinary pH. And he talked about the urine chloride too. With the urine chloride, 
uh, if you follow the urine chloride, urine chloride's low in a lot of these, uh, a lot of causes of metabolic alkalosis, um, like the ones where with vomiting, milk alkali, or the patient who's had too much diuretics and uh, it, the diuretics out of their system, but their their you know their chloride is depleted from the diuretic effect. They'll have low urine chloride. So that's another another thing you can check if you're unsure of the diagnosis um, as well. And we can put that figure in the show notes. Um, but I just wanted to mention, set as all my, just, just people should know it makes carbonated beverages taste bad. And then be real aggressive with the potassium chloride and follow that urine pH. Wait. Now. Wait, wait. Paul, wait, wait. Cardiology. Wait. <laughs> my, my favorite pearl from that episode was that there was apparently a Detroit right fielder that, whose name was Al Colosis or something like that. Is that true? Al Kaline, hey, Kaline. And, Gar- That's what and Garbs somehow, even though Garbs was like the youngest person by far recording, knew about this obscure like right fielder, and uh, I was very impressed. That's why she is a fantastic producer slash co-host slash social media <laughs> guru, and uh, we're we're happy to have her as part of the team. And it did not go unnoticed by our listeners. Yeah, that's right. That was one of my favorite. I think that was that's my pick of the year for names, Paul. That's my pick of the year, Al Kaline. I mean, it's it's a low bar to clear. <laughs> like, so sure. I mean, why why not? All right, now usually it's like Chester E. Payne or whatever. <laughs> um. Well, Paul. Uh, so I was going to tell you a little bit about my practice for peripheral arterial disease. This was number two hundred and sixty. We talked with a great cardiologist, a uh, great friend of ours from training, Paul, uh, Doctor Vlad Lochter. And and Paul, uh, just tell me if I'm doing this wrong. So. Whenever I suspect peripheral arterial disease, people are going right for angiography because I want to know. Uh, I'm definitely gonna. They're definitely gonna need stenting, and ABI is worthless. Is that? Yeah. No. Is that correct? G- great, great, great stuff. Um, <laughs> just adult learning theory in action. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I. So obviously, all wrong. I. This episode, I like. I found it really helpful. I'm not sure. Um, how how you all did in terms of residency training or start training in general started talking about PAD, but like I just I didn't have a really solid framework to think through before. Like I knew sort of aspirin stat and risk factor mitigation kind of, but everyone maybe they saw vascular and I wasn't quite sure. Like it was all kind of unformed to me. And then after this episode, just having the framework, are we talking about claudication or are we talking about critical limb ischemia? Um and that using that kind of as your right. branch point. So critical limb ischemia meaning okay, we need to do something urgently and then claudication um or bread and butter PAD or we have time to kind of work on things and this is mostly medically managed unless we can't manage it medically is, is sort of yeah. the, the branch point. And the, the conversation, we had lots of good conversations about how to make the diagnosis, but specifically ABIs are obviously the, the way that you do it. But then the idea of using exercise ABIs, if you have high clinical suspicion, but the ABIs are come back, you know, quote unquote normal, that's a great way to kind of confirm um, or refute that, that possibility. And then the, a lot of the, a lot of the other, like the management tips I found very helpful, like just in terms of having patients exercise and this idea of ischemic preconditioning, where you basically have patients walk until they have pain and then they can stop and rest and walk again. And basically what you're doing is you're conditioning their body to form collaterals and actually improve mm-hmm. um, circulation overall. So I just, I thought some of the practical management tips were super helpful. And then all that stuff and the patients are still having refractory claudication, or if they have critical ischemia, which is defined by um, rest claudication or, um, arterial ulcers, then those patients you can go to vascular surgery or your your favorite interventionalist to do whatever it is that they do with them um, with sense and pipe cleaners, I think. Yeah. Back to the <laughs> ABIs, Paul. The I, I thought it was just super cool because I never understood the treadmill thing, but it's it's just like putting someone on a like a stress test. It's like you you just yeah. you're just trying to induce ischemia essentially. Yep. Uh, which the treadmill ABI will do. And then the other thing we talked about is toe pressures. So if people have an ABI that's like 1.4 or something like that, then that suggests heavily calcified arteries. These large arteries in the legs can get heavily calcified, but in the toes, that doesn't seem to happen. They don't build up that like heavy amount of calcium. So you can get a toe pressure and you, and the toe pressure can can clinch the diagnosis if if they have those really calcified arteries. Um, so So think about doing that. And uh, yeah, I love it. I, I've now now I'm counseling my patients with PAD. You know, we don't you don't need to rush right to surgery. You don't have ulcers. You know, you're not having rest pain, and we can uh, we can get you on this walking program. We'll aggressively treat all your risk factors, and hopefully, we can keep you out of the OR. I I really like the practical tips as well. 
Um, one thing I was thinking about, I was like, I was trying to figure in my head, how do you do treadmill ABIs? Cause I know how to do regular ABIs and usually the patient's like laying on a, on a, on a bed or a gurney while you do them. I was just trying to like, how do I do like the, like the dorsal pedis dopplers while they're like running on a treadmill? Do you guys know? I have no idea. I think it's like, as soon as they stop, I, th I think you exercise them until they get the pain and then you, and then you, <laughs> okay. and then you take the pressures. I'm pretty sure. But so. Step one, I place the order to send them to the vascular lab. And then step two, I await those lab results is, is sort of my, my practical tip. <laughs> All right, let's go on to number 307. One of my favorite titled episodes, which I, I actually came up with. So I'm, I'm being very self-congratulatory, <laughs> self, self Paul, but this spooky sure. tofurkey cakes. And actually, Paul, I will say I came up with it, but I feel like Sarah Phoebe Roberts incepted this idea I feel, I feel like this was inception. hundred percent. Yeah. This was, yeah. this was a name that she surely would have come up with. And unfortunately she wasn't able to record with us for this, but she, she comes up with really the great themes for our hotcakes episodes. Uh, we had a great candy corn discussion two years ago, Paul, that is still just, uh, yeah, she said it <laughs> just taste, haunts you to it this tasted day. like it tastes like melted down fingernails, but she loves it anyway. I mean, what a great line. <laughs> So anyway, the spooky best. tofurkey cakes. This was a hit episode. We talked Which about. We'll talk about later. We talked about uh, SGLT twos for Hef Hef, um, which was the uh, that was that was part of the big news of this year that the Emperor Redu um, Emperor Preserved, sorry, had finally come out. And like with Emperor Reduced, um, patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, now we also have evidence that they also can benefit from SGLT twos. It did seem that the patients that had this like hef, uh, EF over forty, but in the forty to fifty range, were the ones that benefited most, which is not surprising. Oh, are you saying hefmeref? Hef is that what? Yes, is that what yes, Paul. Is it hefmeref? Is that what we're calling it? I know you love. <laughs> Sorry. I know you love Sorry, all these on. these new cardiac acronyms that weren't around when we were in residency uh, not that long ago. Yes. So both for hef pef. Hef, Meref, and Hef, Ref, Paul. <laughs> now SGLT2s are an option to reduce heart failure hospitalizations and uh, also seems to work for decreasing the rate of renal decline. And Paul, the DELIVER trial uh, with Dapagliflozin is trying to look at this as well for Hef, Pef. And I, I think this is going to be a class effect, but we'll, we'll yeah. find out. Any, uh, any comments on that one? No, I mean, it's, this is the year of the flows in like there's, and so it's year in pH and flows. In, and I, I think we talked about them in a, a number of, of situations, but it's, it's so it's exciting. Like it's especially exciting to have something for, um, half pef specifically, or, or even if we're in the, I, I can't do, even do it anymore, but like that, we just, we were so without any kind of medications that have evidence behind them. So to have something that has at least a signal that we might actually be able to help patients with a particular phenotype of heart failure is, is deeply exciting. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, agree. 100%. I want to talk next about some pulmonary topics, Paul. And would you start us off, number 256, we talked about sarcoidosis, which is, uh, this is one that I really did not feel comfortable with, but I felt we got a lot of just practical advice how we can partner as a primary care with the folks who, with this multidisciplinary team that they talked about that's going to help take care of these patients. But what was your favorite pearl or pearls from this episode? This is going to sound super basic, but I, I just liked um, being given permission to think of it as a diagnosis. You know, I, I think once you, once you highly suspect it, then off to off to the multidisciplinary team they go, and then they'll they'll be better managed than just me doing primary care management of sarcoidosis. But I, I think the point was made: if you have a patient, and I feel like we've all had patients like this who are constantly being treated with antibiotics for sort of recurrent courses of quote unquote pneumonia, or they have chronic dyspnea, or even chronic cough to some extent to some extent, it's just, it's something that should cross your minds at least. And, and if you're, and in terms of the work that you would do for that, once you think of it, the next step would be high res CT, which, um, as we know, sort of the, the workhorse and identifying most interstitial lung disease. So I just, I like the idea of just being reminded, think of it in your patients that have these sort of multiple pneumonia courses that are probably may not be pneumonia or the patients that have chronic dyspnea that is not well explained or this chronic cough that, um, you haven't quite gotten that point in the workup yet. You might want to consider doing your high res CT and just thinking at least about sarcoid. Yeah. What did you like? I think I think outside of a test, I I forget to think of sarcoidosis. But Chris is Chris is setting me up here. I I think he's setting me up here. Chris, so Paul, I'm going to use my favorite device again. <laughs> and uh, Chris is suggesting 
ACE levels, those are super helpful and probably the way we should make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Is that correct? That that would be um that would also be incorrect, <laughs> I, I believe, unless I'm being walked into a trap and then also No. No, I, I think we'll just I think we'll no, leave it no, at that. Yeah, yeah. I have a, Yeah, the ACE levels is sort of a it, it's um in the heyday, again, back back in the days of, of therapeutic leeches, Wado, when we were residents, I think ACE levels had yeah. were being used a lot more, but I just don't think they're all that helpful in terms of diagnosis these days. My my office mate is a poem critical care doctor, and I think every time someone orders an ACE level to try to diagnose sarcoid, he sheds a single tear is uh, is the joke around the <laughs> hospital. So yes, uh, ACE levels <laughs> ACE levels are, are are not as not as helpful as everyone ordering them and uh, standardized tests would have you believe. It's kind of like the ureneosinophils of sarcoidosis, Paul. <laughs> well, uh, Chris, do we have oh, so there's there's a lot of sarco- there's a lot on sarcoidosis. Definitely go back and listen to the episode. Uh, really, two fantastic guests and a fantastic producer, Deb Gorth, put that one together. Fantastic artwork by Edison Jong, Eddie Eddie Jong. So, uh, Chris, tell us um, number three hundred six, I believe, right? We're going to hear a pearl from Mad Dog. Yeah, what do we do. Hey, curbsider, it's Maddie Mad Dog Morgan here. My favorite pearl of the year was from the bronchiectasis bronchiectasis video, um, specifically that you treat Mac with rifabutin, erythromycin, and a sambutol. What I think is interesting is she's apparently watching the video on on YouTube and not listening to the episode on, as a podcast. Yeah, the so this this episode, our guest was uh, just amazing, hilarious, and really, this was a topic that I just did not have a great grasp on at all, uh, much like sarcoidosis. So this was much needed. And uh, thank you to Cyrus Askin and Leah Witt, Dr. Cyrus Askin and Leah Witt for bringing us this one. And I think one of the things on this, Paul, just talking about the, um, you know, thinking about the immunodeficiencies that might, you know, that should be in the, I guess, in your differential diagnosis for this one. And just recognizing that this, like like with sarcoid, the person that has been treated multiple courses of antibiotics and keeps having sputum. You know, think about this getting getting further imaging of the lungs to to look for it. Yeah, that's right. Like, I it's I, I don't think I well I know I didn't mention this with the, the sarcoid pearl, but like you know you might think about something like CVID for someone who's having recurrent upper respiratory tract infections. But if you're if you're thinking that, and um, this should also probably be on your differential for like that kind of chronic cough specifically. I I also the other point that I liked um, was that. This scenario where you have a patient who carries that that anecdotal diagnosis of COPD and they've never smoked a cigarette in their life right. and you're, like they're they're you know constantly coughing up gunk like it just you should it should give you pause and hopefully at some point they've had some kind of imaging but if not again I you now have the benediction to kind of go and pursue perhaps bronchiectasis as a diagnosis because you know if it, it's it, it, with certain exceptions it's pretty hard to get COPD without having significant tobacco exposure yeah yeah and you know Maddie's point about the antibiotic therapy. I mean, she did talk to us about patients that are gonna need treatment. And she's like, I think she even went as far as saying like, I almost can't think of a person that didn't have weight loss that was treated, you know, saying that that's such a key thing. Like they get that sort of pulmonary cachexia syndrome going. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are the patients that you should really think. Like if you have patients that just like can't put on weight and they have bronchiectasis, that's like when you should think. But it is, it, it's, there's a lot of expert opinion involved, it seems. It's definitely above the pay grade of a primary care to decide who's going to get the, the triple therapy and then these advanced inhaled therapies that we talked about briefly on the show as well. So let's go on. Um, we, we had an episode on, um, actually, let me pause for one second here. So how are we doing time-wise? We're at 40 minutes um, and we have, let's see. Yeah, I got 42. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. So we have, we're about halfway. Ra- Raul's is the last of the. Yeah. Um, I might skip OH. I don't know. Should I skip OHS? We can. Paul, what do you think? Why don't you just do it? We can always cut it out if we run long. Okay. I, I think it's a nice, I, I think it's a nice tie together because all these pulmonary disorders are ones that um, are ones that people just forget yeah. about. And this okay. sort of, I, I think it's a nice. Okay. Mm, I don't know. I the I and I it's a chance to make the point again that you can't treat OHS with um oxygen. Um well yeah, with with oxygen monotherapy. Okay. All right. 
Before we leave pulmonary, I wanted to talk about episode number 269, obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Paul, I did not understand this because on air, I, I, I literally thought it was like central sleep apnea. Like I got, I had those two confused in my head and she made the point that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, it's not the same as central sleep apnea. It is, uh, you should think about it in patients who have obesity, who have OSA, who have uh, elevated serum bicarb above 27. Those are some of the patients. And they, you know, they're short of breath with exertion, but they don't have COPD. They don't have heart failure. Some of these other common things that we see. And the workup for this is well within our wheelhouse and echo, PFTs, a chest X-ray, and, uh, and just kind of paying attention, like I said, to serum bicarb. Therapy, because almost like 90% of these patients have obstructive sleep apnea, so they're going to get a sleep study. They should probably be treated as CPAP with CPAP as a primary therapy, unless they're unless they're presenting to a hospital with respiratory failure. Those patients are going to get BiPAP from the start. But a lot of these patients can get CPAP, which is another thing that was just totally surprising to me. I always thought OHS, all those people need BiPAP, and that's not true. That's just those. That was the sampling bias of me working in a hospital and seeing these patients acutely when they present. Right, and seeing acute respiratory failure. Exactly. Yeah. But Paul, what about you? What was your favorite take home? It's, you know, again, I go to all things primary care, but I, I the discussion about weight loss, it's always kind of like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But in this case, it really is the most important thing you can do. And, she, and I remember we're very aggressive in terms of trying to get that done. Like I, if I remember correctly, like refers pretty aggressively to bariatric surgery and has conversations about that relatively early on in the course. Cause it's, it's something like a, was it a 30% weight loss match? Does that sound yeah, right? It was, it was a, like 25 to 30% like a, a lot of weight. weight. Yeah. So it's, 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 I think I underestimated that even though it makes sense, it's right there in the name. Um, I just don't think I realized how, how critical it was and how aggressive to be about it. So I, I thought that was actually a really helpful point in terms of something that I could do to yeah. be helpful uh, for these patients. Paul. So transitioning, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because the traditional weight loss, while I wish it worked really well, it is it is very hard to lose weight. And if they do lose weight, it's very hard to keep it off. And that's why we're now learning that this is a chronic illness. We need medications. We might need surgery to treat this. So let's talk a little bit about the surgical treatment. We had a great episode number 275. What was your favorite take-homes from that one? Um. God, there's so much, you know, it's, it's not, you know, in doing the research for, for the, the metabolic surgery episode specifically, like I knew that it had impact on diabetes say, but I just it did not think of it as a potential cure for it. Like, I think the impact that it has on glycemic control is remarkable. And the fact that it can happen immediately post-surgery suggesting that it's not just the weight loss, but there's other metabolic changes I found fascinating in terms of the, the practical, actionable pearls that I liked a lot, I thought she gave us a lot to talk about in terms of counseling. I think a lot of these patients and and, and physicians, to be to be honest, or, or, or healthcare workers, worry about the perioperative mortality. I think these patients may often have uh, multimorbidity. There may be underlying diabetes. There may be um, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So you may worry that their operative risk is high or too high to at least consider referral. And it turns out that actually this is a very low mortality rate for procedure. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can counsel the patients that is, is a, a safe and effective surgery for what they're going in for. And it's not, it's comparable or probably safer than a lot of other potential operations that they may undergo. So I, I think just being able to talk to the safety of the procedure, because I think that's a concern that comes up a yeah. lot was actually something I found very helpful. And, and then there, there is evidence that life expectancy is improved. Um, also just there's, there's, and there's also, if, you know, if you were just to compare them to patients who are just getting like the usual care for weight, uh, for obesity versus surgery, there's there's a mortality benefit as well. So patients patients can live longer with this. And then, you know, my favorite just practical, straight up practical pearl that I had to go back and like audit my practice, Paul, is this extended release medication thing. You know, you shouldn't be giving extended release meds to patients who have had their uh, their anatomy changed by a gastric bypass surgery because the the absorption timing is going to be all off. So you should really use immediately release medications. And I think that's really important. Yeah, a lot of the the post op care stuff, especially after they've been discharged from bariatric surgery, say they're five years out and there's been no no complications in terms of just not forgetting to check in on labs and monitoring for micronutrient deficiencies and that kind of stuff. Is it? It just it's good. It was nice to be reminded of that and kind of given some concrete guidance in terms of uh, professional guidelines. Yeah. Uh, for that stuff. Yeah. So the the ACE guidelines, it's it's a bunch of society, multi-society guidelines. ACE, I believe, is the headliner uh, from 
2020. We can link to those. Definitely check them out. Really practical. They tell you all sorts of like what what uh, tests to check, how often to check them, um, as far as vitamin levels and things, and how to supplement. So really useful guide, practical guidelines. But Matt, in terms of management, I so correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm hearing you say is that there is absolutely no hope for medication management. In fact, everything that we have. <laughs> is an abysmal failure. And in fact, there's actually nothing new or exciting on the horizon in terms what a of transition. Um, medications for weight loss. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Am I correct in assuming that? You're, you're or... incorrect, Paul. So the oh, on, on number 264, this was a hot cakes episode. We talked about semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams weekly plus usual care. Um, it achieved almost a 15% weight loss. That was average weight loss. So some more, some less. Um, at 68 weeks versus only a 2.5% weight loss with usual care plus placebo. So this is an injectable medication. It is, uh, you know, I will talk about the practical aspects of this. It's still pretty hard to get for patients who are not, don't have diabetes. And you have to start it. It's like 0.25 milligrams weekly for the first month. And then you gradually go up by like 0.25 milligrams um, every so often, like every month or so. And this is a high dose of the medication. Um, some of the reading that I found after we talked about this on hotcakes said that uh, if you stop, it seems like when you stop the, the GLP-1 agonist that some of the weight loss effects go away, unfortunately. So this might have to be a chronic like long-term therapy. And then the other thing was that um, one, of the tri- one of the studies, Rubino uh, et al. 2021, they found that the reduction in A1C with semaglutide at the one milligram dose was similar to the um, 2.4 milligram dose, but the weight loss was higher with the 2.4 milligram versus the one milligram dose. So pushing that hmm. dose up seems to help the weight loss uh, more so than the A1C reduction. Which I thought was useful. I, I hadn't I hadn't heard sure. that before. Um, and I wonder if that's from the GI effects or uh... yeah, I, I don't know. But these these medicines are super cool. I, you know, my my personal feeling, Paul, is that we have uh, like with addiction medicine, I feel like obesity medicine is a similar thing where there's like sort of this like stigma, and we're not providing, making the medications that can really help these people or the services that can help these people widely available. And we as internists need to step up and be like, we are experts in obesity medicine. We are experts in addiction medicine. These are primary care things that we should do. You know, I know there's specialists out here who do this and that's great, but there's not enough of them. So we need to really be great at this in primary care. And that's why we will be doing some obesity medicine episodes and a lot more addiction medicine episodes in 2022. I, I'm getting, I'm getting too worked up, Paul. <laughs> I'm not, I'm <laughs> not screaming. I'm not screaming, but I'm getting too worked up. Chris, what were you gonna say? Yeah, so I, I think what I, I like about uh, these, all these studies, like for semaglutide and all these other GLP ones, is the fact that so many internists and primary care practitioners, we're very comfortable. I think nowadays doing GLP ones. I mean, versus, you know. Many of us may not be as comfortable using, you know, medications like locastrin or fentermine or some of the other like weight loss medications that are, um, especially because we don't have a lot of experience due to um, payment from insurers. Right. But at least we have a lot more patients who are in GLP ones, at least from the diabetes side. So I think that sort of decreases the uh, increases the our confidence and, and comfort in, in order to use them. So I think that's what I like about them. Agreed. That's that's a great point. We. We should talk a little bit about uh, we'll 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 leave obesity medicine and we should talk about gastroenterology. I believe we have a message from the great Dr. Rahul Ganatra. There's Ali again. Did Ali just scratch you, Paul? He's okay. just tearing my leg to shreds. Yeah. <laughs> Please keep this in, Claire. <laughs> Come on, <buddy. laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Rahul Ganatra, and I'm the critical appraisal correspondent for the Curbsiders. 2021 has had more pearls than an oyster farm, but one of my absolute favorites this year came from episode 293, The Best of Liver Tests with Dr. Elliot Tapper. He taught me that in the workup of transient transaminase elevations, you should think about cholidocolithiasis with small stones that have either passed or are acting like a ball valve and causing transient obstruction in the duct. You can check for this by repeating a set of liver enzymes when a patient has pain. 
If the ASD and ALT are elevated when the patient has pain but normal when they are feeling well, that is a very nice clinical diagnosis of cholelithiasis that can be confirmed with imaging and fixed with an endoscope. This, Paul, this was just one of my favorite episodes of the year, I just have to say, because this is primary care, elevated ALKFOS, isolated, you know, elevated, chronic, AST, ALT. These are some of the banes of our existence in primary care, and I just feel so much more comfortable with it after all these wonderful pearls from Dr. Tapper. And uh, just such a joy. We we even did a second episode where you and I tried to like synthesize all of that as like a, a, a triple distilled version. But I, I recommend people listen to the full on. And it was like as long as the episode <laughs> itself, because there was just, it was just pure gold. We just basically repeated everything that he said, except he said it better. <laughs> like, in fact, I actually, if I remember correctly, he used ball valve as a verb, which I, I also thought was just super duper cool. Yeah. Like there's just, there's none better. Yeah. All right. Well, let's speaking of another great guest. Uh, in the area of gastroenterology, Dr. Iris Iris Wang. So what number 266, we talked with her, and I think it was a double parter, Paul, diarrhea disemboweled, but the, the acute diarrhea specifically, I think you had a point you wanted to make. Yeah, it just- You I, had to let I, it out. We talked about this before. <laughs> Great. But uh, just as a reminder to the listeners at home, that our talk with, with Dr. Wang about diarrhea was actually one epi- It was one recording split up into two parts. So we were talking about diarrhea for like three solid hours. It was <laughs> just, just a marathon discussion about diarrhea. But yes, for acute diarrhea, I feel like this comes up all the time um, in outpatient clinic for urgent care visits in terms of when do we do microbiologic testing? Like how do we, who warrants it? What are we actually looking for? Who do we worry about? Who do we not? Um, and so she gave us fairly clear guidelines that were actually, I think, based on uh, a couple of guidelines. I think a synthesis of IDSA and then also uh, American College of Gastroenterology. But basically, you want to do the microbiologic assessment, so things like culture and testing for C. diff and the oven parasites. For patients with dysentery, and that meaning specifically bloody stools, which was a point that I don't know that I differentiated before, if the patient has moderate or severe diarrhea, and I'm not still not entirely sure how to define that, Matt, Matt maybe you'll remind me, if they're at increased risk of spread. So if they're a healthcare worker or if they work in a food service field or along those lines, those patients probably should be tested sooner rather than later just to make sure they're not contaminating the world. If they've been sick for longer than 72 hours, then probably consider testing. And then also if they're immunosuppressed, obviously then those patients weren't testing. But the person who comes to your office with two days of diarrhea after eating um, at a new Chinese restaurant um, probably does not warrant microbiologic testing and they'll probably be okay in five to seven days. But the sustained causes and some of the things that I, I mentioned here are probably pretty good indications to actually do the, do the testing. Moderate, moderate to severe just means that they're, they're having really frequent, like more than five episodes a day. And that if they're being hospitalized for it, I think they automatically, automatically qualify as moderate to severe. Sure. I would hope so. Um, I'm sure there's like a more precise definition, but that's kind of how I, uh, how I would define it. And I will just say, I find the testing for acute diarrhea, very, very low yield because usually it tapers off within the first, like three to three or four days. And by the the day the person decides to come in, it's like peaked and they're already getting better by the time you see them the next morning. Well, if you're, if you're privileged enough to be an attending rounding at like 10 AM the next day after the, uh, after the, the night, night admitting team has made them uh, feel better already. You know, Paul, another, another episode uh, in the, in the category of gastroenterology, number 300, our friend, Dr. Amy Oxentenko, my gosh, Paul, this was a, just a, I mean, incredible. So this was all new territory to me, almost, almost all new territory to me. I know we kind of like touched on celiac before on the food allergy show, but this was just, there's so much to it. I had no idea. And, uh, I, so what I would say about the diagnosis of celiac, which I think is a big thing that we can provide in primary care is, is recognizing it. Um, not every patient is going to have diarrhea and weight loss. They could even be constipated. And uh, it, so recognize it, uh, iron deficiency anemia that's unexplained. You should think about it, um, the patient with, but if they do have diarrhea, weight loss, um, you know, that's a time that you can think about sending the testing as well, some of the rashes uh, and, and things like that. But if the TTG, the tissue transglutaminase IgA uh, is indeterminate, then you can think about sending the DGP antibody, the deaminated gliadin peptide or endomycial antibody. But she said, please don't send like the full panel on every patient from the start. You know, your, your starting test should be a TTG, IgA, and a total IgA level because if they're IgA deficient, then the TTG, you can't really rely on it, um, not the IgA anyway. 
And then most of these patients are going to need a biopsy. And if you find celiac, once they're on a gluten-free diet, two years later, you're going to repeat the biopsy again, and you're going to monitor the titers, and you're going to monitor the um, endoscopic response to the gluten-free diet, and you should be able to heal them up. And the reason that the, the way to get buy-in from patients is tell them, listen, like this is terrible for your bones. Like you're going to be more at risk for bone fractures. And uh, there is a not zero chance of some of these gut malignancies that could happen if you don't follow a gluten-free diet. And you should just feel better on a gluten-free diet. And uh, hopefully you get by and it's become a lot easier nowadays to uh, to, to live on a gluten-free diet. Paul, any, any favorite or any other things you wanted to add? Yeah. I mean, we talked about this elsewhere. I, I, again, I think it goes back to the overarching point of think of it like that's, that's like the, you can't make the diagnosis until you actually think about it. So there was the point that often, especially young women, I think we attribute iron deficiency anemia to menorrhagia and you can, you can, you're certainly allowed to have menorrhagia and also celiac disease. Right. So it's, um, so it, it don't, don't roll that necessarily just because you have someone who gives you a history of heavy periods. And then also the, the point that you made, it's, you're not going to catch it if you're always thinking about the prototypic presentation. So I think 15% of patients present with constipation, 20% of patients are diagnosed over the age of 60. Um, who, who have celiac disease. So like, it's not, it, it's not always going to be the classic patient. And then the other point, and then I'll stop talking about this, but I just, I love this episode so much is in adults. Once you make the diagnosis, those patients need a baseline DEXA scan. And also you need to talk to their first degree relatives about screening uh, also for, for celiac disease. Just, um, yes. just, so like, I think those are two key, again, primary care points that we can sort of easily do. And I don't think that I was thinking of, um, no, definitely. Until, until we had this episode. Definitely not. So that, that's a great one. And this provides a great transition, Paul, to osteoporosis. Oh, what are you going to say, Chris? Oh, actually, I was going to ask about the DEXA. Like, what what age? Any age? Like, when whenever you you diagnose the celiac? She, as an adult was, I think, what she said. So I don't know that it yeah. was specified more. Though. She because I, I think Beth actually asked that follow up question, or maybe I'm making it up, but I, I think Beth asked that as a follow up question because in young in young folks, you don't know how long they've had celiac and how long. So it, it, yeah, it was recommended for adults at baseline. Um, but that was a little surprising to us too, right? Because if you're just diagnosing a 30 year old woman, but I guess theoretically they could have low bone density already. So speaking of bone density and speaking of DEXAs, number 277, a lot of pearls on this one. We talked about osteoporosis and low bone density, um, formerly known as osteopenia. <laughs> but the, the big take home for me was that you, the ACP has a guideline, which I somehow was unaware of, because uh, it, it's from 2017, Paul. And it, it says that you, you should not check or you do not need to check DEXA while the patient is on bisphosphonate therapy or while, while they're on, uh, yeah, pretty much talking about bisphosphonates here. And that if they're on zoledronic acid, you can check after three years. If they're on an oral bisphosphonate, you can check after five years and see where they're at. Like if they've gotten better, or if, there's, um, if they've gotten better, uh, or I guess if it's stable, then you can probably stop at that time and then check like every year or two just to see if they start to fall off again. And if they either fracture or the bone density falls off, then you could put them back on bisphosphonates. But we really, beyond that first uh, five years of oral bisphosphonate therapy, we were just like, kind of like, what do we do? We don't know. Right. Because there's, there's variability interpretation, right? So you can't, you have to take with a grain of salt that the changes in bone density you would see if you yes. would happen to be screening on a yearly basis. And then I think she made the point that ideally you're using the same machine each time right. that you check too, because they vary from machine to machine. So there's a lot of, it's kind of unnerving how much of it seems kind of subjective. Yeah. Like I know we're calling it objective, but it also seems like there's a lot of um, variability in terms of the interpretation. So there's no reason to trip yourself up by right. by checking over and over again. You're just going to confuse the issue. It sounds like. And, and, and then what the last point I'll make about this one was, uh, Oh, Chris, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that, you know, I think most insurance companies won't let you pay. They won't pay for a bone density if it's closer than every two years either. Right. At least that's what I found. That, that may be the case. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I usually don't order them that often. So it's, it, hasn't, right. been, yep. it hasn't been an issue, but yeah, that, uh, that is a good point. And I, I think it's, it's, it is a test that the patient has to disrupt their life to go get it. And it's, so it's, I think this is great news for patients. You get start the medicine wait five years, then check um, if they're getting the oral bisphosphonate. And then you decide at that point, is this a holiday or are we going to continue with treatment? And uh, just beware if your patient's taking denosumab, 
that as soon as they stop those infusions, you, you got to be you got to be careful because they can really fall off a cliff as far as uh, bone density goes. And if they're a candidate for for bisphosphonate, you can put them on a bisphosphonate within six months of stopping denosumab because you you want to protect that bone density. And I guess with the pandemic, there's a lot of concern about people missing doses, Paul, which is obviously not great um, yeah. for fractures. Paul, your nemesis, uh, your fake nemesis, because he's a lovely person and a fantastic doctor and educator. Well, let's not get <laughs> Dr. Away. Jeff like Colburn. Fine, but, yeah. uh, this episode, diabetes uh, FAQ, some frequently asked questions. And uh, what did you have any favorite pearls from this one, or you want me to start? Why don't Why don't you lead off, and I'll bat clean up because I'm sure that you have a ton. Yeah. So you know, the, part of what we wanted to get out of this was how how can we suss out is this type one or type two? And you know, when do we need to test for type one? And he said, my approach is anyone in their 30s, anyone in their 30s or younger that is presenting with new diabetes, he, he thought it was worthwhile testing. The antibodies you can send, there's a lot of them. Um, GAD65, beta islet cell, or insulin antibodies are some of the ones you might uh, you might send. There's definitely more than that that you could send. And then um, even if their BMI is elevated, you, you can't always, like that doesn't always tell you if they're type one or type two. So the, the BMI is not reliable, probably in both directions, you know, just cause it's low doesn't mean it's not type two. So another trick that you can have up your sleeve is, uh, checking a non-fasting glucose and a C peptide level, because if the glucose is high, the C peptide should also be a little bit high. And if you check that and they're both high, okay, that's more consistent with like a type two insulin resistance. Um, and But if the C-peptide is low, meaning it's inappropriately low and your glucose is high, then this is probably someone that has type one diabetes or just somebody that is is a burned out type two that is going to need insulin. And uh, that's not something I was doing. I don't know about you, Paul. No, no, not consistently. So, and, and this, I do, I do, did you find this as like a difficult thing, like the type one versus type two, when people are seeing you from hospital follow-up as, as a, as a new diabetes? I mean, for me, this has always been a little bit of a, a you know, a, a, of a pickle, if you will. Yes. A hundred percent. It's always, it's always been a little bit nebulous and there's that, the, the, the um, the ketosis prone type, like the diabetes patients who are like, it would fall kind of this nebulous category and how do you categorize right. them and, and you know, how you help it. So yeah, this has always been something that I've struggled with. So this helped clarify things a fair amount for me. And before I think the other thing I really loved about this is, you know, all I want is validation really. And like, he, he gave me the blessing to not get so hung up on the basal bolus regimen that I think we've talked about at length. So, um, it, Jeff made a lot of great points, uh, but the, the thing that he emphasized over and over again is we have new, really good medications and we should be using them for diabetes. Right. So like it's sulfonylureas are, are almost sort of last resort. Like I, I think the way the guidelines are even written are actually kind of nice. Like if, if they're to be used, if the patients can't afford the medications that are actually good and work is what sulfonylureas are for. But otherwise, like we should be thinking GLP-1s are such good medications. They're covered by most plans. The SGLT-2s are obviously very exciting. Metformin is kind of your base coat. Like, so don't, don't be afraid to use them and actually preferentially reach for those before you started going with the older standby. Yeah. So like, I, I think you just kind of really leaned to that point, which I thought was always helpful. And to even you could recategorize, you know, some of your patients on basal bolus, uh, especially if they're type two, maybe that was, that was done at a time where we didn't have such great medications. Yes. So you might, you might simplify things for some of your patients and maybe they're on uh, a long acting insulin plus uh, plus the SGLT2 and, and you can remove their their bolus insulin or, or taper off their bolus insulin. I've, I've started to do that on some of my patients as well and they love it uh, because yep. like you said, Paul, it's it's like it's it's like having a disability, you know it's people equate it to that. that's how unpleasant it is to be on basal bolus insulin. And it's expensive. it's it's quite expensive too it's between the testing and the injections. Like there's just, there's so much, it's so yeah. impactful on quality of life that if you, if you can find some other way to do it, you should. All right, Paul, home stretch, a lot of quicker pearls here. Paul, have you melted anyone's toenail yet? Uh, we talked on common skin complaints. We talked about onychomycosis. <laughs> we talked about toenail melting. You no, you know, I haven't, I have to admit, and you, you were so excited for this. And I think that you're even going to report back and let me know how you've been doing. So tell, tell me, have you, have you melted off someone's toenail <laughs> and did you inadvertently hurt their foot in the process? I, I did. I did. As far as I know, I didn't hurt any feet. I think I've given three or four patients this 40% urea cream, 
which they can put on their nails. The idea is it like softens the nail. And sh- and, and Dr. Pacheca even mentioned, yeah, you know, the nail just kind of, it's if, if, they're, if their nails are really heaped up and chunky and they can't fit in their shoes, this will give them maybe a better cosmetic experience. And then I know some patients, some of my patients notice it softens their nails. So then they'll use another topical medication. Um, it hasn't been long enough yet, Paul, because it takes like a year for all these things to, to really you know, work if you're using topical therapies to try to, to cure someone. So it's a little early. And you're supposed to put like painters tape down on the skin so that it doesn't actually touch yeah, that I or read how, that how does that work? Dr. Exactly? Pacheca said she doesn't routinely counsel patients on that, but I did read that in another source. They said, just be careful. Like the urea, the urea, uh, 40% cream, maybe keep it off the skin around the nail. Just keep it, just put it on the nail plate directly. So that's what I've been telling patients to do. Um, put it on, See if you like the cosmetic result, but I'm like, you got to use it for several months to know if you're going to get, get the result. Um, but I was super excited about that. And then Chris is the fluff test up now on YouTube. People are asking us about that. And we, we got, we're going to get better audience about putting the videos up when we say it's there, it's there, it'll be in the show notes. It's there. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Chris. Paul, any quick pearls from this one on chronic pruritus, which uh, was which is another thing that's like in primary care, you get a lot of these patients, um, especially I tend to see older patients with chronic pruritus. Yeah, and I, I felt fairly comfortable doing so the, the standard lab battery and looking for erythrocytosis and and liver dysfunction and thyroid, like none of that stuff was all of that stuff was relatively low yield. The point that kind of blew me away was the fact that statins can be a culprit. And then she gave us a little bit of background pathophysiology too, just because you, you need lipids for the, <laughs> the bilayer uh, membrane. So if, if you're lowering lipids, you're going to have by necessity actually have some dry skin. So like, I, I thought that was yeah. interesting. Not that it really helps all that much because probably they need the statin, <laughs> but at least you have something to blame. I then. think people like to have an answer, Paul. Let's be honest. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's true. Yeah. This And this one... You know, for for chronic pruritus, she gave us this Yapsipovich article that's like her favorite to to hand out to all her trainees, and it really does have some nice tables in there, uh, figures of, like of flow sheets about how to go through the algorithm. So we'll link to that article in the show notes. I think you can't go wrong with ceramide containing moisturizers, and uh, if those are too expensive then just good old uh, petro- petroleum jelly uh, is what I always used to call it. I guess petrolatum, Paul, is that the right way to, is that the fancy way sure, to say it? Perfect. Yes. yes. Yeah, so that exactly. can be a little yeah, bit less expensive, but uh, definitely just, you know, use emollients uh, and uh, tell them to put it on after they get out of the shower. But it, chronic pruritus is a, is a tough one, especially this time of year. It's the winter in the, in the great Northeast, Paul. It gets, it gets cold and dry here. It's terrible. I now, do not Paul, recommend Bring us home. We have uh, the USPSTF. This uh, this has been. We started the year off with a an episode titled "What the USPSTF," and then there was many recommendations. It's a very hardworking organization, and we've we've started to do some regular episodes with them. So please bring us home. Yeah, it's this. Start, so starting, and this was almost at the very beginning of the year, looking back. But episode two fifty one, the, the what the USPSTF, just how how do they work and what are they and how do this like because we followed them fairly dogmatically. So it was it's nice to find out where they came from. It turns out they're, they're all volunteers, which I thought is nice. And then I think the other thing that I, I was a little bit surprised by is when they're considering any of these recommendations, they're, they're factoring in risks and benefits. They are not talk. They don't think about cost at all. Like they're just sort of agnostic when it comes to, right. to cost, which I find fascinating. <laughs> um, I don't know what to do with that information, but I just think it's interesting. Um, and then now having, knowing that, having that in my back pocket, they fired off, I think, was it 27,000 recommendations this year? I want to say they either revised or, or updated or gave new recommendations. So um, we'll start with, I, I think one that has been pretty impactful is from, uh, also from episode 251 is this um, hepatitis C screening uh, for patients, for basically all adults, for patients aged 18 to 79, which is an update from the prior recommendation uh, for patients born between 1945 and 1965. And it just, it turns out that it's just, it's such a prevalent disease and it is now so eminently treatable and there's such um, benefit to it that it's, it just, it makes more sense to screen the adult population. And I'm constantly turning up in clinic and I'm sure, especially in the inpatient side um, where we have fairly universal screening at cash like North Northeast, um, we're just finding all these new cases that can be treated. So yeah. it's, it, once they get um, intake into sort of contact with the health system. So it's, it's been a recommendation that I've seen immediate and real meaningful impact from, which is exciting. The, the other one that I think, uh, the other big update this year was the colorectal cancer screening age dropped to age 45. And 
what I, my big take home from this was, you know, direct visualization, colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy is not the end all be all. It's the USPSTF said it's perfectly acceptable to get the more frequent stool based testing, like a fit test or a sDNA fit test, which has the DNA and the fit test looking for blood. So you can, you can do either of those tests and hopefully that will increase the number of patients that are getting screened by starting earlier and allowing them to choose either one of these direct visualization tests, which sometimes requires patients to take a day off work, find someone who can drive them home from the colonoscopy. Um, these, a lot of my patients are opting for the stool-based tests, uh, at least when they're like busy working and they can always cross back over and get a colonoscopy if they want to, but at least we're screening them in the meantime. Yeah, I think they made a larger point, which I love, is that the best test is the one that your patient does. Um, so, and I, I think that's, and I've, I'm not sure what your experience has been, but I've done a lot of negotiating where, you know, we can certainly do this home testing, uh, the stool based testing. If it's positive, then you'll get a colonoscopy. And I have much higher success rate uh, with that than sort of leaning heavy into colonoscopy, which it turns out, you know, it, it's a great test, but it's, it's not for everyone, at least as an initial test. And I think just using that as a negotiation tool has been very helpful for me. I've actually found that, um, especially, um, recently, you know, with the passing of Chadwick Bozeman, like, especially among a lot of my, my patients, my black patients, that they are much more in tune to having that discussion. I think that's been very useful. And so the timing of the, the recommendations and, and everything yeah. else happening in pop culture, I think has been actually to our benefit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I'm not sure if there's a name for that yet, like the Bozeman effect or something, but, you know, having like a a, a young actor at like the height of his career play, who's playing Black Panther uh, get taken down by colon cancer. And then, then they drop the age, like within a couple months of that, it, it just, it, it's, it's made it much easier for me to have the conversation. Cause now people are aware of colon cancer in that age range. Cause they, they watch the Marvel movies like, uh, like we all do. All right. I, I also think like one of the, uh, like just as, as COVID ebbs and flows, I, I think, with this pandemic existing, patients are much more acutely aware of their own health. So I'm not sure what your experiences have been, but as we come to these valleys where patients are returned to the clinic, I have so many patients being like, okay, I want everything done. All right. Like now I need to get back on oh, track. I want to get my health caught up. And I, yeah. so I, I'm, I feel like I'm seeing a fair amount of that. And maybe I, maybe that's just um, maybe some degree of projection on my part, but I feel like people are coming back in the clinic after a gap of time, very invested in their health. Now that there's been this sort of scary um, disease that's kind of literally in the air. And Paul, I believe there was one more on unhealthy drug use. And, uh, uh, you know, it's getting late. I'm, I'm too tired to to frame this. So just uh, I'm just getting right to the point. Yeah, and I, I'm a little bit surprised because, I mean, as excited as you are about addiction medicine, you were practically shrieking in prior uh, recommendations. <laughs> this, this is just um, just the recommendation is that you should be screening adults for unhealthy drug use. And they they um they don't tell you which specific tool to use, but just to use a validated tool. I think on the episode itself, we actually talked about using the NIDA assessment, which is a very nice and, and very accessible um, tool that can be accessed online. Um, the caveat being is that you have to have the capacity to actually do something about it should you have a positive screen. But I would hope um, in a primary care office, you have some means of doing that. And I hopefully we're empowering you in some way to, yeah. to help address some of these things as well. Go, go to our episode uh, episodes page and click on addiction medicine and, uh, and work through that back catalog. We have a lot of great stuff there. I also just want to remind people to make sure you're, you're also screening your much older patients, like your elderly patients. Because you know, for most of us who do like Medicare wellness exams, I think one thing that is part of that screening is to screen for uh, you know, substance use disorder and unhealthy drug use. So just remember, like some of your older patients are maybe using drugs in an unhealthy way as well. So just another plug for that. You know, Paul, it's been... Almost six years now that we've been releasing episodes. It's been almost six and a half years that we've been uh, doing the show. We started planning this in September 2015, and I I cannot believe how uh, literally it's taken us all over the country. And uh, hopefully, we will be touring the country again in 2022. If anyone wants to invite us, we'll consider it. Let's see what happens with this whole pandemic <laughs> nonsense. Uh, or not nonsense, this whole pandemic, I should say. Uh, but I just wanted to thank the audience. I mean, the reason that we keep doing the show is uh, because it's very it's very helpful to us, but I just feel a lot of, uh, I, I feel like the audience wants us to keep doing the show. We get such nice emails and comments and posit positive feedback from the audience 
that it keeps driving us to do this. And um, I like to think, Paul, that not only are we benefiting and the audience benefiting, our speakers get to get their message out there, but also I hope down the line that we're, we're changing patient care for the better. And, uh, you know, this has just been an amazing privilege to be doing this. It's been, like I said, I can't believe it. Six, six and a half years been working on this thing, Paul. What the, what the heck? That's a lot. It's, I mean, it's remarkable. And I, I, I agree with everything that you said and, and you said it very well. Like, I think every so often you'll see on Twitter, like, Hey, I listened to this episode and made this specific diagnosis. And like, it's just, it's kind of mind blowing. And I, I, and I've made this point before in terms of things that I get out of the show. I, I agree with everything you said. It's been so great to sort of travel around the country, meet new people. And then I also to keep us current, but I, I will say, and I've made this point again, but it's just, I can't say it enough that the team that puts the show together um, are just are such an inspiring group of people like they're they're excited about medicine they're excited about medical education they are passionate about sort of the mission of those things and it's 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 kept me inspired during a time that it frankly has been sort of emotionally and mentally exhausting so it's hard to be excited about anything um, but, but yet somehow being surrounded by these people who just who care so deeply about taking good care of patients and learning and staying curt and has been it's just it's endlessly inspirational to me and has made me a, a better doctor and probably honestly even a better person so um, just very grateful to be a part of the show. Yeah, Paul. And this has been, I mean, this is, these people are essentially volunteering their time to help, help us work on the show. And they've been doing this for over four years now. They joined us in like September, 2017. Crazy. It's, we've been like, I mean, we've been a family, a, a team doing this longer now, much longer now than we've been doing the actual show. So this is, this is a huge team effort. And so many of our team members have now branched off, and now they're running their own shows. Uh, Doctor Doctor Chris Chu Chu Man is is one of them, and uh, that's just been great to see. Paul, I think we are we're like the SNL of medical podcasts, aren't we? <laughs> Except funny. <laughs> oh wow! I think with that we should get to the outro. Sure. <laughs> 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 I clear cut all of that out. <laughs> Centering. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Yummy. Pause, pause, pause. But there we I go. I was going to let Chris do it. I wasn't <laughs> sure with the delay when it was going to come in. <laughs> I'm not, listen, I, I, you know, we're all on a freight train heading towards death. I don't have time to wait for someone to say yummy at me. Get your show notes to thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. We are committed to providing you, Paul, it's late, with high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we really want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify. Or you can send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Uh, we just thanked our team, but a special thanks to our producer for this episode, Chris the Chew Man Chu, who is also on Facebook. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is our executive producer and runs Twitter. Nora Toronto is the editor of the Digest. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. Tima Karganov does the website. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Claire Morgan of Natterly edits our audio. And finally, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And this is Isabel Valdez, physician assistant here at Cashlack, wishing everyone a great holiday season. This has been Maddie Mad Dog Morgan. And this has been Dr. Rahul Ganatra. I would also like to thank all the new and old Curbsider team members, and in no particular order, Jen Wado, Molly Hoban, Era Kristen, Chris Naskaya, Hannah Abrams, Carolyn Chan, Justin Burke, Sarah Phoebe Roberts, Deb No Name Korth, No Nickname Korth. <laughs> Cyrus Askin, Avi Oglasser, Emmy Okamoto, Kate Grant, Meredith Trubit, Edison Yang, Moni Amin, Adaman Barelski, Elena Gibson, Leah Witt, Jeremy Mitnick, Melanie Gandhi, Gandhi Alyssa Mancini, Amena In. Oh man, I should have looked at all these names before I started doing them. Amina, Amina, <laughs> Amina Nchastigui, Jingi Yang, Jordana Kazupski, Sheila Brown, Victor Kovac, Wendy Martin, Al and Alex Chaitoff. And this has been Chris the Chew Man Chew. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. All right.